Okay, so tonight, Tales of the Night Lawyer. What is that? Well, if you're watching this channel, uh, you presumably like media law. And also, I know a lot of you like the behind-the-scenes stuff of legal life. So, I thought I would talk about night lawyers. Um, what are night lawyers? They're the legal advisors for newspapers who check for things like defamation, contempt of court, etc. Uh, firstly, though, night lawyer. Does that imply the existence of day lawyers? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, the newspaper also have day lawyers. And I once covered um, for one of the day lawyers. Um, but that's just general sort of commercial, contractual, corporate stuff. Um, for example, um, there was some celebrity who was going to do a Q&A with the readers in exchange for which they got sort of a fluff piece in the newspaper and I drafted the contract for that. Um, but that was quite unusual. Normally I did the night lawyering. Um, the Probably the best way to explain what a night lawyer is is to just describe a typical night. Um, so what would happen is I would basically stroll down to the newspaper about half six in the evening after I'd finished working court First thing I would do is I would go to the office where the lovely ladies um, who pretty much run everything, um, you know, they'd make tea and biscuits. And I would sit there and I would read um, all the injunctions uh, that come in and what back then were called DA notices, uh, defence advisory. Um, they're basically things from the government about national security issues that they'd prefer you not to talk about. Uh, interestingly, as the name suggests, uh, they are just advisory. They're actually called DSMA notices now. Um, but there's no obligation on a newspaper to abide by them. However, in practice, you know, they tend to do that because, you know, they realise either the national security implications or they just don't want to lose access um, to people. Because, you know, if, if you were to run a story the government didn't like, you won't be getting invited to all the nice things. Um, so I would go through those. Um, they're not particularly anything particularly interesting and stuff uh, it, there's a few standing ones like you know you can't report on sort of the movements of nuclear convoys and things like that um, and every now and again there'd be a specific one you know like please don't mention that there's some troop movements or people are shipping out of Portsmouth something like that um, and also the injunctions um, you know you can't talk about this this is confidential this is a secret judgment um, you know, there's a super injunction uh, to refer to uh, my previous video. So I'd go through those and then about seven o'clock I'd go to the actual newsroom. Now, one thing is you don't actually meet any of the journalists. I mean, these days everything is either phoned in and people just transcribe it or usually it's just done by email. Um, and to give you sort of a bit of a backstory on this, back in the old days when there were newspapers on Fleet Street, uh, there was one particular pub that we used to frequent, uh, the White Heart. Although famously that was known in the journalist trade as the stab in the back, because it's also it's where they always used to take you when you got fired. Um, and that's just a little ritual as well. When people used to get fired at the paper I, I, I was at, everybody would sort of bang the desks and cheer as they, as they were escorted out of the building, which was, you know, not a totally irregular thing, although quite often they'd be back like two weeks later. Um, but yeah, in the in the pub, they literally had a row of phones on the bar so the journalists could phone in their copy to the newspaper while drinking. I mean, it's all sad now that that's all gone. Um, but yeah, I was over in another location. Um, so I would I would go to the news floor. And basically, the people who do put the newspaper together, they're called sub-editors or subs. So you've got the actual editor of the newspaper, but then lots of sub-editors in you know, different departments, um, sort of, you know, news, sport, media, uh, whatever. Um, and I would just sort of sit down. Um, and it's interesting how they put the newspaper together. Um, somebody literally hand draws a copy of the finished product that they're aiming for. So they will sit down with the editor and say, how much space are we devoting to each story? What photographs are we going to use? And they would sketch a life-size copy in pencil of the newspaper. And they would draw the photographs and they would put all the headlines in and then they'd just sort of like scribble for the text. You know, uh, obviously they wouldn't write all the text in. But just to get the general layout of the newspaper. Um, and I would say that sometimes you might get a query. Um, so you'd get an email coming through saying, this is a story, I've got a few issues, can you just give it a quick scan? Uh, but to be honest, a lot of the time, I mean, these sub-editors, you know, they know their trade very well. They're very well versed in, in, in the law uh, relating to things like defamation and contempt. So there wasn't too much a lot of the time to actually do. You know, you, you would read through. Uh, and basically, I had a sheet of paper with 88 boxes on it, and I would do one page at a time. And when I was happy with the page, I would tick the box. And hopefully, you know, within a few hours, I would have ticked every one of those boxes and I could go home. Um, 
But if there was an issue, um, say, for instance, I spotted something and went, oh, that's a bit, you know, possibly problematic. Um, to sort of cover myself, actually, because you could, you know, if it was just a quick thing, you would just walk over to the relevant sub-editor and just let them know. But it was always nice just to have a bit of an audit trail there. Um, now, the way the paper is put together is it's just done on regular desktop publishing software. And I would pull the article up and I would write the advice into the middle of the article. So they either had to see it, they couldn't pretend they hadn't seen it, or there was also the risk, somebody saying, there is a risk that one day we're going to send a story out. <laughs> we're just going to have a paragraph in the middle from you going, ooh, I'm not really sure about this. She's bound to sue. Um, so, but, so, so, so that was sort of my thing. I would go through, check a story out. If I was happy with it, I just wouldn't say anything. If there was a problem, I would just highlight it, say, you know, you need to tweak this. There's an issue here. I mean, most of it was relatively straightforward, to be honest. Um, but here's one thing um, with defamation. The, the law on defamation, I, I could take you through it in, in, in an afternoon, um, explain everything you need to know about the law. But it's one area where you really need to know how you know how the courts operate because it's very easy to say oh if it's a matter of public opinion it's not defamatory but where do the courts draw the line you know is this one of these chase levels one two or three things you know the chase levels are how you the courts categorize allegations especially of like things like criminality you know chase one is yes he definitely did it chase two is there are reasonable grounds for suspecting he did it and chase three is there are grounds for investigating whether or not somebody did it um what you do is you you have to do this on the fly. I mean, this is the thing, you know, when you do a defamation case, you might think, oh, well, we'll sit down and spend ages working it out. But it's very much a gut feeling thing. You just have to be able to look at it and go, that's defamatory or that's not defamatory. Uh, and you need to be able to do that instantly. And that effectively is the skill set. Um, you know, it's the old thing about, so, you know, you've charged me $100 for, you know, tapping a nail and it's like yeah hundred dollars you know is tapping the nail it's for knowing where to tap the nail it, 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 it that, that's effectively where the, the the skills come in so i would just go through that uh, you have to be careful sometimes because if you've got a sort of complicated story um you know the subs would go oh that's fine well you know just put what you want it's like well hang on, I, I don't i don't write the stories you write the stories i'll tell you what the problem is i'll suggest a few word changes but i'm not writing the entire thing i mean another problem i had is i never knew anybody anything anything was you know, so I sit there go like, uh, so, right, so what you're telling me is some soap actress I've never heard of is having an affair with some footballer I've never heard of, or she's actually married to some musician I've never heard of. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, if true, brackets, and we can prove it. Um, to be honest, a lot of the time, though, it's not about the truth. And, we, you know, we, we've seen this in a lot of cases because you're sort of going, you know, will they actually sue? Or, you know, we have so many other stories on this person they won't dare sue. Or there's one particular case where some celebrity was getting a bit of a thrashing in the press because of their monetization of their life. And there was a story that went out that everybody knew was just absolute rubbish. Uh, but everybody ran with it because they knew they wouldn't sue because, you know, it wasn't defamatory in the sense that defamation lowers, you know, your estimate, esti your opinion, uh, you know, how, how you are viewed in the eyes of the general public. And if you're already seen as a bit of a money grabbing laughing stock, you know, can you really make that any worse, even if the story is not true? Uh, so th those are the sorts of decisions um, you do on the fly. So defamation was the you know major thing we were looking at. We also have to be very, very careful about contempt of court because, strangely it sounds, although the monetary impact of contempt of court isn't necessarily that much, you know, the fines for contempt of court are a lot less than defamation payouts and the cost of fighting defamation proceedings. But obviously, it's it, it's criminality, uh, and uh, you know, and that's not something you want. Now, what you might not know about newspapers is. Um, obviously, when the early editions go out, the government get them straight away because, you know, we've all seen the thick of it in Malcolm Tucker. They have people who just read through the newspapers straight away. They're actually looking for stories and whether they need to, quote, spike a story. You know, that's like, oh, we really don't want this story out there. Let's do something. Offer them something in return or put some pressure just to stop this going out. But also, you know, they'll look at the legal things and so I go, that, that's a contempt. Um, and there's also people who read the very early editions of the newspapers and tip off people who may have been defamed. You know, they, they'll have all the contact numbers for people's managers and agents and say, hey, do you know there's a story about you in here and I think it might be defamatory? And, and they'll get paid off for bringing it to the people's attention. So if something is dodgy, there are people keeping an eye out for it. Um, 
And to give you one example, I was <laughs> I was just getting ready to pack up to go home, you know, after finishing finishing my shift, and one of the runners ran over and just sort of said, "Oh, hey, Al, it's, uh, there's some solicitor on phone for you." It's like, mm-hmm, w- 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 which solicitor? Uh, some general solicitor. I went, what, you mean the Solicitor General? Yeah, that's him. (laughs) He's like, oh, okay, that's a phone call you have to take. Um, And that was rather embarrassing, actually, because of my complete lack of knowledge of football. I had allowed a story to go out that was in contempt of court because this this was back in the days when there were lots of uh, footballing trials about certain offences. And the mere fact that somebody's a celebrity doesn't negate that all usual what we call reporting restrictions apply. I mean, you know, if there are to be ID parades, for instance, you know, because you can't say, oh, this is the suspect, and then they see them in the paper and then do an ID parade and say, yeah, that's him. Because then the defence will say, well, hang on, you're not identifying the person you say did the horrible thing. You're identifying the person you saw in the newspaper. And there was an injunction saying you mustn't identify any of the teams. And I, I, I let a story through saying, uh, referring to the team saying after last Saturday's match. And it's like, well, you've identified, you've narrowed it down to two teams. And it's like jigsaw identification. You're almost there. I said, well, hang on a minute. All football matches are on Saturday. And it turns out they're not. And then I got a big lecture about how the premiership works. Uh, but but it, they were very nice about it. Uh, and with a bit of tweaking, the second edition went out with a somewhat, somewhat different story in it. Um, the first editions actually tend to go you know, out into the wilds because you know, they've got further to go. So you know, you, somebody, somebody in Glasgow was probably reading that one, but nobody else did. Um, so yeah, that's the, sort of, that's the sort of thing you do. So you go through, you're checking for contempt, you're checking for defamation. Um, sometimes a little bits of copyright, although there's, there's, there's this thing that there is there is no copyright in news. Um, so even if something says exclusive, so long as you don't rip it off word for word, you can actually just take that story. Uh, and people do quite sneaky things where they will they will take a story from another newspaper and then they will put questions in there as if they were doing an interview with somebody. Um, you know that happens quite a lot. I mean, exclusives people like exclusives, but um, you know they're, they're not quite they don't stay exclusive for very long. Um, I would say I very rarely dealt with the journalists. Um, sometimes you know some of the feature writers I would have to have words with. Uh, I remember once with one particular feature writer had written an article about how unfair a particular law was. I said, actually, that, but that's not what the law is. You've just got that wrong. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> this, this is a really good story. And, you know, there was no legal problems there. I mean, that was always the thing to keep separate the, uh, you know, the journalism aspects and the legal aspects. I was not there to comment on the stories. I mean, if I saw a headline that I thought was distasteful, we could also go, ooh, that's a bit. But, but, but you know, that that wasn't my job. Um, and I really loved it. I really loved it. The people were lovely. I mean, I was supposed to sit next to the actual editor, editor. But I used to sort of just have my little desk and then I would just drift around and just chat. You know, I spent a lot of time actually with the sports subs because I don't even like sport, but they're just, right, they're just really cool people to hang around with. <laughs> they're just right, really good fun and they have lots of good stories. Uh, there was also a subsidised canteen there that stayed open all night. And it was so sort of pleasant you could like egg, you know, to get like egg chips and beans for a quid. <laughs> so I would quite often disappear down there. Um, you know, just off to the canteen. Have you got your phone with you? Yes. Is it turned on? Mm-hmm. It is now. Um... So I've sort of got down there. Although once the uh, actual head of uh, legal at that particular news group um, did, did come in once, one of his rare visits there, and just sort of went, oh, you just grabbed me and said, you sit next to the editor. So oh, okay, okay. And then we sort of like looked out the window, and as soon as he drove off, it was like, look, it's nothing personal. <laughs> he's going, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. You go, you go. You know. So um, he was quite. He, he was a really nice chap, actually. I'm not going to name any names, uh, but he, you know, there was a lot of pressure on him because you know he. He looked after sort of like these newspapers and various other um, sort of media outlets within this media group. Uh, I remember he once came in and he said, he said oh, so what? He says, the editors really like you. I went, oh, that's nice. He went, no, it isn't. If you're doing your job properly, they should effing hate you. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of, you know, part of the, part of the pressure of the job. Um, but yeah, I would sit there um, and basically as the story, you know, paper came in, I would sign off on it. And eventually, 88 pages later, it was like, hey, it's all done. And I would just disappear off. Uh, technically, you're on duty all night. But, um, you know, you, once you'd sort of signed off on the first edition, uh, you, you usually safe to go home. And if anything came in, they, they would ring you, which I always liked because you got extra money if they actually rang you at home. So you'd sort of hope something would happen. Although I do remember on one occasion, I was just packing up to go and somebody ran in and said, Tony Blair's had a heart attack. So, you know, so like, what do we do? What do we do? And, you know, I was trying to get away. I said, well... 
I don't, I don't want to sound awful and everything, but you know, there's all, uh, we've got a few issues about medical privacy, but you'll be getting briefed by you know cabinet office, um, so you know that's not a problem. Although you know, this was in the sort of back in the old days uh, where you know the privacy aspects weren't quite as firmed up. Um, and when it came, it came to medical stuff, you remember Gordon Kay, the low, low guy, and he was really badly injured and he was in hospital and some people snuck into the hospital room and took some photographs. And he actually brought a claim in malicious falsehood because at that time, although there's never been legal aid for defamation, there was legal aid for malicious falsehood. So he brought a claim for malicious falsehood. I mean, now you'd bring it for sort of breach of GDPR or privacy or something like that. So, you know, I had to sort of say, well, you know, watch out some of the medical issues. But that was really cynical. I said, but, you know, if, if heaven forbid he shuffles off this mortal coil, just remember that defamation is one of those claims that your estate can't hurry, <laughs> can't inherit. So, you know, print what you want. Um, and I sort of just disappeared out of there. Um, what else do you need to know? Well, like I said, the newspaper's done on this desktop publishing, and on the floor below, there's all the actual printing presses. And they're pretty much just operated by one guy who just goes around and checks that they're working. It's a very skeleton staff. I mean, it's not like the old hot metal days. And you can see why the print unions did get upset about this, because so many jobs went away. And you lost all those Ill, old skills, you know, like, you know, sort of actually, you know, doing it in, in hot metal and being able to read, um, all printers could read in mirror writing because that's, the newspaper is done in reverse and they could they could just read as if it, as if it was normal text. But it's just a desktop publishing thing um, and each sheet of the paper, four pages is like one sheet of paper, is one sheet. And each of the printers, the bins, they're just on the computer as if they're regular printers. So you have to be very careful. It's like, oh, I just need to print this email out and make sure you clicked on the right icon so you weren't just sending <laughs> downstairs and printing 10,000 copies on a so, you know, piece of paper that big. Um, and the other interesting thing is, you know, in your printer, you have sort of all your inks, you know, cyan, yellow, and magenta, and black, or K, as they call it, because it's key. Um, it's the same thing there, but they literally delivered the ink in proper, like, petrol tanker-sized vehicles, and outside there were four manhole covers, you know, C Y C Y M and K, where they would deliver the ink. That's how much ink they got through. And we're all sort of tempted to go down with a syringe to top our print cartridges up, but couldn't quite reach. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so so that was it. I mean, like I say, just to summarise, in terms of the legal thing, it's just a matter of, yeah, you know, Check the injunctions, check the DA notices, go in there, check that everybody's happy with, you know, that everything's, you know, hunky-dory with the newspaper. You are effectively just, I won't say second-guessing, but you're providing a second level of checking because, like I say, the sub-editors knew the law, you know, probably better than I did in a practical sense. Um, and then and then you would just dis disappear off. Um, and, you know, that was pretty much a typical evening. And I would go down... Uh, I, I officially I covered wrote shifts for other people. You know, I was the spare, but you get people. Got, you know, I, I tended to be down there quite a lot. <laughs> it's all like, oh, can you cover my shift? Can you cover my shift? And yeah, and it was great, um, and it's really good fun. But now you know the pressures, and when you go start going, gosh, you know, how, how did they let that through? Do because I actually had this once as a judge commenting on some case, a, a case that had been reported quite, you know prolifically in the press it's a very notorious sort of case and afterwards he did have a word about that he did have a word he said he said, he said you know it's, it was slating the daily mail you know, you know that, that, and then he said and, and he said and but and as for the you know my newspaper he goes <laughs> and the other newspapers i did the sundays as well he goes do, do these newspapers even have lawyers <laughs> which actually you know that did get fed back to me um but, you know, there's always that tension between, you know, if it leads, it bleeds, making it a very interesting story, um, but also staying the uh, right side of the law. And uh, for the most part, we got it right. Uh, but now when you're watching going like, oh, well, you know, what happened there? How did this story get in the press? Well, 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 well now you know. <laughs>